You know what can get you into a lot of trouble? Loaning money to family or friends, or co-signing for them. But they're your friends and family. You want to help them out. So how can you help without putting yourself at risk? How can you say no to family and friends? Well, stay tuned. The experts are here, and we're going to discuss it starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. The panel has assembled. Maureen Parent is joining us by Zoom from Kanata in the Ottawa region. And Scott Schaefer is here with me in our studio in the Hoyes Michaels Kitchener office. We want to financially help our friends and family. But if you go into debt to do it, you put your own financial life in peril. That's not good. So I want to start with some cautionary tales of what can go wrong. Obviously, if I take out a big loan to help someone and they don't pay it back, that's a big problem and I can lose a lot of money. But it doesn't even have to be a big loan that can get someone into trouble. So Scott, start us off with a smaller example of how people can get into trouble. Yeah, One we've seen recently is somebody who has trouble with their cell phone. Uh, so they end up asking a friend, can you get me a cell phone in, in our name together, joint, or can you get one and have it mailed to me? I'll pay it. I'll take care of it. And you say, sure, I'll help a friend out. I'll get you your cell phone. You get a plan. You finance that phone. And the, the individual keeps paying for it. You don't even know about it. And all of a sudden, now you're collection call because that person had a job loss and they stopped paying it. The, the bill was not coming to your address. And lo and behold, you're now on the hook for this debt that you didn't even know about that is also now affecting your credit report. So it could be as small as just getting a cell phone that you've co-signed for or got in your name for somebody. Yeah, and you think a cell phone, okay, that's 100 bucks a month, no big deal. But if there was a phone and they didn't pay for a number, months next thing you know it's a thousand bucks or more and generally by the time you find out about it it's already in collections it's, it's a big number okay so that's a small type of example maureen give us an example of something a little bit bigger than that well um we had a client who co-signed a mortgage for friends that were dear enough to feel like family but life went sideways for that family and they had to file for bankruptcy so our client filed a consumer proposal to deal with the debt but was embarrassed because she had worked so hard to live within her means and felt quite hurt about being put in that situation and sad for the end of the friendship that happened. Now, I know that Ian Martin was telling me a story, something similar to this. Um, I can't remember exactly what the story was. You got, wait here, wait here. Ian's office right next door. I'll be right back. Just stand by. Stand by. Okay. Let me, come on, everybody come over here. Just, I'll be right back. Ian, are you here? Ah, perfect. Doug, Doug, hey, hey. You got a mic on. That's fantastic. <laughs> this works out great. So you were telling me a story about somebody who helped somebody else out or something. I forget how it worked. Tell me the story. Uh, yeah, and I, I guess it is uh, convenient that I am all mic'd up while you're busy recording for Debt Free 30. So let's take advantage of that uh, good fortune. Um, yeah, I remember what you're talking about. I had been chatting with, uh, with an old buddy from university. We hadn't... Uh, you know, you get busy with life, right? You know, work and kids and stuff like that. We hadn't chatted in a while, so we're just, you know, catching up like you do. And uh, we couldn't help but reflect on the last couple of years and COVID, the pandemic, and all the stress and uncertainty. At some point, the conversation turned to his brother. So this is a guy, I mean, I think he brought it up because, I mean, at some point, his brother was somebody that I would have also considered a friend, but also, he knows what I do, right? He knows I talk to people all the time about money problems. So he, I, I think he, he felt, you know, kind of, you know, comfortable talking about it. So he's, he's laying it out for me, his, his brother. You know, it almost sounds like a, like a bad old-time country and western song, right? Lost his job. Marriage broke down. Uh, even had a heart attack, right? So I don't think his dog died. But other than that, it was like this really bad sequence of events. So obviously my, my friend, I mean, he wants to help out his brother. He wants to help him, you know, emotionally, but then also financially. But he has obvious concerns, right? Nobody wants to feel like they're getting taken advantage of. Um, nobody wants to take on, you know, undue risk where now you put yourself, um, you know, at risk of not being able to pay back your, your, own, your own bills and debts. And I think really the, the idea, like, you and I have seen this in different ways is really easy to throw money at something, whether it's helping somebody to throw money at your bills on a regular basis, but it's not solving the problem. So nobody wants to feel like there's like just like slapping a bandage on some kind of major wound that really requires surgery. So, um, so here's what my friend did. And it's still kind of early, so time will tell whether it really works out or not, but I think he's done a good balance of trying to, um, or rather a good job of trying to balance out these different considerations. So, 
sits down with his wife, talks about it, and I mean, they, they want to help, right? There's, there's young children involved, so they want to, you know, help provide some kind of financial stability for, for, uh, for the family. So they, they make the difficult decision to lend $20,000 to the brother, and this is uh, as a down payment for a small condo. Um, so there's different reasons why they were willing to do this. Uh, number one, they didn't have to, and, and this is not everybody, obviously, but they were will, they were willing and able to lend twenty thousand um, dollars without having to borrow it themselves. So it's another layer of risk if you have to borrow the twenty thousand dollars yourself to then lend it to somebody else. So that's money that obviously they want to be paid back, but if they can't get paid back, they're not going to be on the street themselves. Um, another factor that was. Um, an important consideration is that the brother was able to find work. He was able to rebound. He's able to find work. So he should be able to pay it back. Um, but then also taking it even one more step. Um, so my friend helps, I know it gets kind of confusing, this guy and that guy. So my friend then helps his brother set up a budget, something that he had never really done before. And built into that is a bi-weekly payment timed with the brother's paychecks so that the loan between the brother's will be paid back on time. So I think that's really, you know, it, it, again, it provides a really good balance of, of all these different considerations. And it, it made me think, Doug, of the old expression, right? You give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, but you teach a man to fish, and hopefully you feed him for a lifetime. So to me, that was a very, um, uh, again, we'll, we'll see how, how things play out, but it has the potential to be a, kind of a success story uh, financially. Yeah, the, the key to it was they limited how much they were lending. Right, exactly. It wasn't a blank check, and yeah. then they helped with the budging to exactly. help the guy get back on track. Exactly. Excellent. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. I'm glad you were wearing it. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay, did you guys hear that? Did you guys hear that? Yes, we did. So yeah. it was really lucky that Ian happened to be wearing a wearing a mic when I walked in there. So that was that worked out really well. So... The example he gave was kind of covered both of the, I mean, it was a cautionary tale, but it was also how to mitigate the risk. So I think that was, that was pretty good. So I want to go through, we're going to get back to the practical advice, which Ian has already given us some. I want to go through kind of the lightning round here of what are the different areas where people can get into trouble. So Scott, you already gave the example of the the cell phone. Maureen, you've, you've already talked about it as well. So let me start with Scott. Just start firing things at me. What's where are the areas you can get in trouble? Got it. I'm going to go back to what Maureen started with the co signing for a mortgage. You know, probably generally pretty low risk, you know, quite often needed because the housing values are so high, but it affects your credit. You're now taking on somebody else's debt that's going to on your, be on your credit report that could affect your potential down the road for your debt to income ratio. Or if things go sideways, you're now on the hook for this mortgage. So, you know, number one is co-signing a mortgage is, is a common thing that we see. Yeah, and you're right. We haven't seen a big problem with it recently because house prices keep going up. So even if the person can't pay, everything's fine. What happens if they don't go up? could be a bigger problem. Yeah. Okay, Maureen, back to you. Give me another example of how something you can co-sign for that gets you into trouble. Well, co-signing a car loan. And as Scott mentioned, that will also impact your credit report. Yeah, because if they don't pay, then you're you're on the hook with it. Scott, back to you. The other common one is with housing values going up, parents tapping into the, their equity in their home, getting a home equity line of credit to give to their adult kids to you know use as a down payment on a house or to pay for a wedding or to fund somebody's post-secondary schooling. So they're funding their child's livelihood or future based upon their equity in their house. All great if they pay it back, not so much if they don't. Okay, Maureen, tell me, parents, kids, what else can get them into trouble? Well, parents borrowing to help pay off their child's student loans. Yeah, the kids already got the loan. Now they've graduated. Hey, no problem. I'll help you out. Let me borrow the money. Can get you get you into trouble, Scott. Yeah, the other one is 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 costs are up so high right now for kids to move out. Their their rents are so high, so the kid just never leaves home. So we're seeing more and more kids in their twenties, sometimes in their thirties, still living at home but not contributing. So it's fine that they live from home because it's it's more affordable, but they don't add back value to the family by contributing to the costs associated with them living there. Yeah, and you're you're paying for it, Maureen. Back to you. Give me another example. Helping siblings or other family members when you're carrying debt yourself. Scott? And just helping friends in tight spots. You know, we always have somebody that, that's having a rough spot. You know, we've been going through a pandemic, people in and out of work, people need some money to pay off some some bills, some urgency. So just helping out friends in need. So, okay, we've given a whole lot of examples of how you can get into trouble helping other people out. 
why? Why is this? Why is it that we get into to trouble? Is it just, well, you know, we're nice people and we got to help out and that's, that's, you know, why we do it? Or is there something else to it? Now, Maureen, I'm pretty sure you have like a psychology degree or something, right? So let's just assume you're an expert on this topic. Give me some reasons based on both your education, but also the people you meet with all the time. Why is it that we are in some cases excessively nice and that gets us into trouble? Uh, well, yes, I do have a psych degree with some social classes, but that was a long time ago, but I haven't lost my interest in the study of mind and behavior. So I still kind of do a lot of reading and stuff in that regard. So we do have a desire to be liked and loved, to please, to fit in. We don't want to disappoint or hurt someone. We fear that the other person will feel rejected or take offense if we say no. We also fear that it'll damage the relationship. We also have a fear of conflict. We don't like it when others are going to be angry with us or critical of us. In my research of a few different articles, there was a reference to a study um, where the researchers went into a library. They requested strangers to um, uh, deface books at the library by writing one word in it. And half of the people did it because they couldn't say no. And that was even to a stranger. So, and then the last point I would have is that there's also differences between men and women. Women tend to be socialized to feel responsible for the feelings and well-being of others, where men don't tend to feel like they don't want to rock the boat. So, is this a a helping people thing, or is this a self-image thing? Because you you talk about the difference between men and women, and of course, you were on the podcast where we talked about that exact topic. Right. Um, is this a helping thing, or is this a self-image kind of thing? Uh, I think it's a both thing. Definitely self-image is a part of it as well, because we all have a self-image. And for those who have a self-image of I'm someone who helps others or I'm financially stable or I'm a supportive mom or dad, saying no can then threaten that self-image. And that can stir up negative emotions such as embarrassment and guilt. And we do tend to try to avoid those negative emotions. We also do tend to dwell on the impact of saying no. So as Dr. Susan Newman points out in her book, The Book of No, humans tend to have a harshness bias. So we believe that others judge us more than they do. Except for trolls, most people have completely forgotten about your answer and have moved on to ask someone else. Yeah, so you don't need to be worrying about it forever, I guess. So Exactly. Okay, so I'm not a psychological expert here, so I, I'm going to assume what you said makes sense because it made sense to me. So I think we can all agree, yep, I want to help others for whatever the reasons. Um, sometimes it's it's a good reason. Sometimes, well, maybe it's a self-image thing. But obviously, you got to be careful. And, you know, I, I think it's a, a case of limits, right? Like, I'm happy to go to the, the blood bank and donate blood, but I'm not going to donate all of my blood. That would obviously obviously be crazy. So, Let's now move into practical advice. That's what this whole show is about. So someone comes in, asks me, you, any of us for help. Um, what is the thought process you go through to? So so someone comes to you, Scott, and says, hey, I would like you to co-sign this, this loan for me. So what are the things that are going through your head? What should our listeners and viewers be thinking about when that is raised? Yeah, look at it from a few perspectives. Number one is, in general, the person co-signing it, has no financial benefit from it. All they have is a financial obligation. So there's no gain from doing it other than getting it for somebody if else. If I'm so, the co-signer, I have, uh, it's negative, not positive. Correct. There's no benefit directly to me other than helping somebody else. But I, I think about it from the, the bank's perspective and the individuals who's asking's perspective. So if you think about the bank, why is a bank asking for a co-signer? Why are they requiring it? It's to protect their investment. They are lending money and they want to get paid back. So the person in front of them may not qualify for it on their own because the bank's thinking, they may not be able to pay me back. I need somebody else to pay it back for them. So the bank will look at it to say, you know, does a person have too much debt already? Is there is there a smoking gun there that the bank's saying, you better get a co-signer here because we can't do it for you? Is your income too low? Once again, we'll lend to you, but I don't think you can afford to pay us back. We really want somebody else on the hook. Um, and common one also is they have little credit. So kid, parents helping out their kids coming out of school, they haven't got a credit worthiness built up yet. So from a bank's perspective, Think about why the bank's asking for it. Then think about the individual side of it. Why are they wanting this loan? Can they afford it? Can you do the budget with them? But always go to worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is that person cannot afford to pay it. You're now obligated to do so. Are you willing to do that? 
we've lived through a pandemic. People have come and gone from their jobs. People have been able to afford to pay things and not afford to pay them. A lot of things are outside of the individual's control. Their best effort is, yes, I will pay it. But when you have no income, it's pretty hard to do so. So really think about what can go wrong before you make that decision. Yeah, and I agree with you on the bank. If I'm a multi-billionaire and I go to the bank to get a loan, they don't need a co-signer. It's only if my credit is impacted, it's not great. Or like you said, maybe I'm just starting out, just graduate from school or whatever. So the bank is asking for it because they need it. And I'm coming to you because, well, I need to get it from you. You're the one taking all the risk as a result of this uh, this thing, uh, this asking for the cosigner. So right. because deep down inside, the bank's expecting you to have to pay it if that guy does it. That's at the end of the day, it's a security for the bank. It's exactly what cosigning means. So, okay. So Maureen, when someone comes to you asking, hey, can you co-sign this for me? What, give me some more practical advice as to how you would go about, you know, well, thinking about it or saying no. Right, so give yourself time. It's important to stop and take time to think before answering and to give yourself time to speak to others. Sometimes we do need that support from other people to help us have the strength to say no, because that is difficult. My personal stance is that if anyone is at, is not giving me the space to think, then it's definitely not good for me. So my answer is automatically no. So you're saying chill out. That's basically what you're saying. Chill out. Yeah. And, and that makes sense because if my, you know, kid who's older is coming to me to co-sign a mortgage for him, I don't have to give him an answer in 10 seconds. I can say, hey, let's think about it. Why? What's going on? Let's go through the, the whole thought process and then make a decision. So I think that's good. Don't be forced into anything. You don't have to make a decision immediately. So, okay, Scott, back to you. What if, you know, I want to help out, but I just don't have the money to give to help out? What What's the thought process right. there? Find, find out what's going on. Do, do the budget with the person. Can you help them cut their costs? Can you get them to reallocate some things? It's not... A, paying something or giving somebody money may only be a band-aid if their budget's already bleeding. So what can you do to help that person financially without giving them money? There's many other tools, budgeting through it, helping them with costs. Just just really look at what could you do to help them. As Maureen said, take the time, absorb it, take a couple months, see where things are. Yeah, I mean, it may be that the reason the bank's requiring a co-signer is your debt service ratio is out of whack. Okay, well, is there anything you can do over the next few months to bring your debt service ratio back into whack? Uh, and, and on that note is, are they trying to get something that's too big for them? So if they're trying to get a car loan, for it, if we can go on to that part for a second, is what if that's too expensive for them? What if their budget shows after three months that they could not afford that item? So take some time so we don't set them up to fail. Getting them into something too soon, too big, too much is is not going to be a good thing for them. Yeah, and I mean, you you mentioned cars, and and Maureen, obviously, that's you know after a house, that's like the the biggest thing ever. So, if someone's asking to co-sign, it might be for a house, it might be for a car. What's your advice when someone says, "Hey, I need a car to get to work. Can you help me out?" Right. Well, like Scott said, I mean, it is really important to make sure their budget can afford and support the car that they're wanting to get. For one. But maybe instead of co-signing, say, hey, since I can afford it, I can help you with a deposit, which will help maybe lower their car payments rate right, to make it even more affordable in the budget. That way you're putting, you're helping, but you're only helping to the extent that you're able and you're not on the hook if anything goes wrong in the future. And, and adding on that, when you think about the budget, the car payment's one part of it. I've got, oh, yes. yeah. I, I, I've got an 18 year old and a 20 year old. The, the insurance for those kids are a lot. Like. When you do that budget, can they also afford the insurance on it? Do the whole perspective. Gas prices are going up. Do more than just think about just co-signing for that one item. It's a bigger picture item. To yeah, and I guess if we had to give one global piece of advice, that would be it. That the person requires help to get this loan and you're the one they're coming to for help. But their ultimate objective is, well, I do want to buy a house. I do want to get a car. I do want to pay off these other things. Okay, so look at the entire big picture and see, are there other areas that that can help out? So I agree with Maureen that rather than me co-signing on the car loan, because this is a $40,000 car you're buying, and if you don't pay, if the car gets wrecked, if the insurance doesn't cover it, whatever, I'm on the hook for that entire shortfall. If I help you out with the deposit, maybe the deposit is a couple of thousand bucks or whatever it is. Well, okay, the most I can possibly lose is a couple thousand bucks then. 
You got no long-term impact on you for that. Well, and the car loan, if I co-sign it, that appears on my credit report. You kind of made that point earlier, Correct. Scott. And obviously, if I co-sign for someone's mortgage, that's also going to appear on my credit uh, my credit report. So now I have impaired my own ability to borrow. Your, your debt to income ratio definitely will be affected by that. So it will make different decisions in the future different because of that fact. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I mean... <laughs> You you got to look at the at the whole the whole big picture. And I think you also had made the comment something along the lines of, um, you know, what's the downside to all this? So you really do have to stress test this to see what could possibly go wrong and understand how you would how you would mitigate that. So, um, okay, so give me you know one more piece of advice then for someone again who's you know coming to you for help. Maybe you don't have the money to give. What else can you do? Well, is there other ways to to contribute without giving them cash? Can can you let them move home and stay with you? Can there be other ways? Let them borrow your car, but in return, have them do stuff for you that's not cash transactions. Can they help out with the household chores? Can maybe they do some babysitting for you? Can they do some things that will cost you money, but you now have the ability to have them give back to you? So can you... You know, once again, instead of find, uh, co-signing the car loan, let them use a car until they can get back on their feet for themselves. Can they move in with you? Reduce costs, but then have them pay back through non-cash transactions. Yeah, if I've got some old used car that I'm not driving as much because I'm working from home or here, use that for the next couple of months. That's a lot better than me co-signing on a $40,000 car loan and getting myself into into a huge amount of problems. So, okay, so Maureen, um, you know, wrap this up for us then. When we're looking at family members, friends who are coming to you, asking for help, I need you to co-sign, I need this, I need that. Give me your kind of closing thoughts on how you say no or how you do whatever you got to do to keep yourself from getting into even more trouble. Right. Well, it's important to remember that saying yes doesn't mean it will lead to a better relationship. In fact, it can build up resentment, possible financial stress, and end with the dissolution of that relationship. Um, another thing to think of is you want to speak openly and honestly about your concerns about those financial pitfalls. And if that person's response is, oh, don't worry, I'll pay, like no worries, then that person hasn't fully considered the impact that it'll have on you. So you want to make sure that you're really taking a step back to think about things. And the last point I would have is to understand why it's difficult for you to say no. If you need to see a therapist, work it through a bit, or if you'd prefer, try reading some self-help books like, you know, Susan Newman's The Book of No or Saying No by Asha Phillips. Those are just some examples. There's plenty of other books on that because it is so difficult. And it's interesting. You made the comment about relationships. So the person who's asking me for help has kind of put me into a bit of a bind here mm -hmm. because... Okay, they want my help. If I say no, I'm worried now that they won't be my friend or if they're my family member, boy, it's going to be really uncom uncomfortable uh, for a Thanksgiving dinner when they come over because I said no to them asking for this loan. But the flip side of it is if I give them the loan and they can't pay me, that's also going to be quite uncomfortable, isn't it? So yeah. you have to look at, at the impact on the relationship both ways. And I think kind of the point you were making about the, from a psych psychological point of view as well, I want to be helpful. So I perhaps do things that are a little bit outside of my capacity to, to actually help. So, okay, exactly. Scott, uh, give me some final advice. Yeah, so for me as an, account, as an accountant, I always think about the, with the worst case scenario, what can go wrong? Where will this go wrong? How is it going to impact me? So the car, the car, you fight, you, you co-sign for somebody's car, they pay for it for a year, they lose a job, the car gets repossessed without your knowledge. All of a sudden now they're collecting against you. You now have this uh, amount that you got to pay for a car that you never got to drive, you never got financial benefit for, you're now on the hook for it. So do a worst case scenario. We're not saying that co-signing is always a bad thing. It's just prepare for the worst case, then it can only get be better from there. Money will change relationships. Money will change things more than anything else. So plan for the worst case scenario, monitor it, keep up to date. If somebody, if you're given an obligation to somebody, make sure they have an obligation back to you to report. How are they doing with it? When they get in trouble, let you know. Work on the budgets together. It's not, it's a long-term relationship together when you co-sign for somebody. Yeah, I like that idea of reporting back to me. So, okay, I've co-signed this car loan for you. I'm not going to find out until you're way behind and the car's been repoed. 
So it wouldn't be a bad idea to be touching base every now and then. Hey, how's it going? You still working? Still making the payments? Everything cool? Because if you find out quickly when something goes off the rails, it's a lot easier to pull it back than when it's already been repoed and it's it's kind right. of too late. Co-signing is for that individual. They have an obligation back to you. And I also liked what you said. You didn't use the same term, but basically you said stress test it. 100%. So what is the absolute worst case scenario that can happen? So I co-sign for, well, I, I take money out of my HELOC to fund your education, to buy your car, whatever it is. If you don't pay me back, I now have that debt of the entire amount. Correct. Can I make the payments? If you can't make the payments, can I make the payments? Correct. And what, what's the impact? So that one child doesn't make the payments and now they have other siblings and something happens to mom and dad and now there's issues with potential inheritance. It, it just can make the family dynamics much more complex. As Maureen pointed out, money does change things for people's relationships. Okay, so I get the last word because I work the board here, so I get to I get to say the the last thing. So so here is, and I agree with everything you guys have said. My advice, in fact, speaking of books, I don't know why Maureen didn't recommend this one, but it's called Straight Talk on Your Money: The Biggest Financial Myths and Mistakes and How to Avoid Them by Doug Hoyes. That's me. And as you all know, page one hundred and eighty-five, and you can all everybody playing the home game, you can you can flip open to myth number twenty-one. Um, page 185, where I say, I answer this question. And I say very clearly, never loan money to family or friends. That's like the the first section of that chapter. Never loan money to family or friends. That's my policy. Now, does that make me a very cruel and evil person? No. Yeah, yeah probably. But Maureen says no. no. The It's, and, and why doesn't it make me an evil person, Maureen? Sometimes saying no to people, it isn't a bad thing. It's actually saying, you know what? I believe in you. You have the ability to do this on your own or it's got to happen another way. Like it can be supportive to say no. I like that. I like that. Uh, you know, you can do this on your own. You don't need me. You don't need me propping you up. The reason I give that advice is because if I loan you money and you don't pay me back, then we both feel bad. And even if I've got tons of money and you've asked to borrow a hundred bucks and a hundred bucks is no big deal to me, I know that if I loan it to you and for whatever reason you can't pay it back, you're going to feel bad about it. And it's going to put that strain whenever we talk, whatever. And if it's a bigger amount, I mean, you gave the example, Scott, you know, I, I loan money to one kid and they don't pay me back. And my other 12 kids are now upset because they've, you know, used up part of the inheritance. It, it can go off the rails really quickly. However, the other side of the argument is, yeah, but I have the, the resources to help. I mean, think of parents today. And, you know, Scott, like you said, your kids are sort of old teenagers, young in their 20s. Maureen, your kids are younger. My kids are both in their 20s. And if someday they want to buy a house, they can't afford it because no kid to, can buy a house. So the only way you can get a house is if your parents bank a mom and dad kick in for the down payment. So, and if they don't pay me back, then I'm, you know, we're, you know, we're all offended by the, by what happens. So what's my advice? My advice is if you really, really want to help someone and if you have the money to do it, give them the money. It's not a loan. I'm going to give you the money. There's no strings attached. If someday you're able to pay me back, great, but I don't expect it. If you don't pay me back, it's not going to crush me financially because I've got the the wherewithal to withhold that. And it's a gift, not a loan. So there's no hard feelings. So when you come over for Thanksgiving dinner, if you weren't able to pay me back, oh, well, I helped you out. It was a, it was a gift. And that forces me to make absolutely sure that it's not going to crush me financially to do it. If I take 20 bucks out of my pocket and pass it through to the screen to Maureen, if we had that technology and she didn't pay me back, oh, well, it's 20 bucks. It's not going to break me. Same thing if I'm helping someone with a car, a house, whatever, I'm only going to give them the money that I know isn't going to seriously impure, um, wreck my financial future. So if you think of it that way, you can still help as many people as you want, but only to the extent of the, the cash that you've got. What I really like about that is you took away the judgment because if somebody's not paying you back money, 
you're judging them on what they spent their money on, what they're doing. They Every time you talk to them, they talk about what they're doing in life. Like, okay, you have money to go do this, but you didn't have money to pay me back. So I like how you you took away that judgment of what somebody would have on somebody if they're not paying it back. Yeah. Or on the flip side of that, Scott, is you may not have any judgment on how they're spending the money, but that person in their head, because of the harshness bias, they're thinking in their head, oh my God, you're judging me on what I'm spending. And then they start to feel stress in their life for everything they spend, knowing that they're not paying you back. Money, money strain is it st- will put a strain on that relationship yep. in the wrong way, and that's and that's why you've always got to be thinking ahead. So, okay, we've gone through a ton of practical advice. As I say, my practical advice is don't loan the money, give it to them. If you can't afford to do it, don't do it. So, hopefully, that was helpful, Maureen. Thanks very much for being here, Scott. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much for being here. That is our show for today. I'm going to put show notes on YouTube of everything we talked about, including the the books that Maureen mentioned. So, uh, you know, please go there. If you are watching this on YouTube, there's like these like buttons and notification buttons and share buttons. So just click all of them. Make sure you've subscribed so you get the podcast every week. And if you are listening in to the audio version on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or any other uh, uh, podcast player, then again, please subscribe, like, leave a comment so you get the podcast every week. Thank you very much for listening. For Scott Schaefer and Marine Parent, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30.